Hmm? My current is low. Sure. Sometimes well, my voltage is so about the same. Yeah. 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 The, the voltage is less because uh, 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 that sucks. Yeah, no, he's saying the whole puncher is bad. He's saying that us people without hair have, have no, too, no, too few. You're right. You're right. I need more holes. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, we normally have about 50 people in the audience, but since this is our first uh, live meeting, I think we haven't been able yet to publicize it enough so that the people who usually come are here. Um, the idea for, I'm the director of the center at Nersessian, uh, the idea for these uh, and um, Elias Dakwar, and then uh, that coding was an important subject and had many angles to it, and maybe we should have round tables on that. And Jerry Horowitz, who is the associate director of the center, then took this and developed, amazingly, five round tables. And so tonight, today, this morning, we have the first of those, and then we have four more, two more this afternoon, and two uh, tomorrow. Uh, I want to thank all the participants who uh, volunteered to come here and have a conversation. And uh, I leave it to Jerry to introduce everybody, and we take on from there. Thank you, Ed. It's a real pleasure to be back here live uh, at the Helix Center. Um, let me take a moment to introduce our esteemed panelists today. Uh, I'll try to make this quick, but it's certainly interesting. The thought, I'll, I, maybe I can introduce the idea behind this talk, which I think is a little bit unusual. So the, the, the theme of the conference is over coding. sort of study of well, what it, how, do we, how did we all come to the idea of what codes are and what coding might be. Um, I find that, and this I'm sure is true, uh, a lot of our ideas have sort of been concretized now, and it means one thing, which is sort of programming and coding, but codes have a long history, and uh, what their meaning is, I think is fascinating, uh, and so we'll take that up. So first, Georgi Buzaki identified a hierarchical organization of brain oscillations and proposed how these rhythms support a brain syntax, a physiological basis of cognitive operations. His work changed how we think about information encoding in the healthy and diseased brain, such as epilepsy and psychiatric disease. Several laboratories worldwide have adopted his framework and provided supporting evidence for the two-stage model of memory in both experimental animals and human subjects. Buzaki is Biggs Professor of Neuroscience at NYU. He is among the top 0.1% most cited neuroscientist, member of the National Academy of Sciences USA, member of the Academia Europea and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Michael Novacek is a curator and professor of paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History and senior advisor to the museum's president. From 1994 to 2021, he served as the museum's senior vice president and provost of science. Hmm. Awarded a doctoral degree at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Novacek studies concerned patterns of evolution and relationships among extinct and extant organisms. His interests have ranged from the fossil record to data on DNA sequences. He has led a participation, I'm sorry, he has led or participated in paleontological expeditions in, North Amer in the North American Rocky Mountain region, Baja California, the Andes Mountains of Chile, the Yemen Arab Republic, Argentina, Saharan Africa, Morocco, and the Gobi Deserts of Mongolia. 
Karen B. Stern is a professor of history at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. Her research is deeply interdisciplinary. She studied classics with honors at Dartmouth College, earning her MA and PhD in Religious Studies from Brown University, and has excavated and conducted field researches, research in different areas of the Mediterranean, including Jordan, Greece, Tunisia, Morocco, and Israel. Several grants, fellowships, and residencies from the National Endowment of the Humanities, Council of the American Overseas Research Center, and the Getty Villa have supported her research, which deeply employs, employ, deploys methods from the fields of archaeology, anthropology, epigraphy, history, and the religion and religion to investigate the daily lives and material culture of Jews and Christians in antiquity who inhabited areas around the Mediterranean through Arabia and Mesopotamia. David Salter is a professor of psychiatry, neurology, pharmacology, and at the School of the Arts at Columbia University and New York State Psychiatric Institute. He received a PhD in biology from Columbia University. His lab has published over 250 studies on synaptic function, particularly of the basal ganglia and dopamine systems, and neuroimmunology in normal and disease states that are cited over 50,000 times. He is founder of the Dopamine Society, the Gordon Conference on Parkinson's Disease, and the journal Nature Parkinson's Disease. He has received awards from the McKnight, Simons, Helmsley, Narsad, Huntington's, and Aaron Diamond Foundations, and the Universities of Jerusalem, Minnesota, University College of London, and National Science Foundations of Israel, Austria, Portugal, and given name lectureships at the National Institute of Health, Harvard, Yale, UCSF, Emory, UC Irving, Irvine, and the Vatican. Mark van der Meerkoop, oh, sorry, Mark van der Meerup is a historian of the ancient Near East and Egypt from the beginning of writing to the age of Alexander of Macedon. Besides teaching at Columbia University, he has taught at the University of Oxford and at Yale University. He directs Columbia Center for the Ancient Mediterranean. He has published numerous books and articles on various aspects of the, the ancient Near East of the ancient Near Eastern history, Egyptian history, and world history with interests ranging from socioeconomic and political history to intellectual history. He has written extensively on historical methodology as it applies to his field of study. In these writings, he aims both to present the materials of these fascinating ancient cultures to a broader audience and to explore new paths of research. Okay. I think we're done. <laughs> so, thank you very much. So I guess I'd like to get started with my, sort of the premise of the talk, which is if one of you or several of you want to discuss your ideas of what, code, what coding and decoding means very generally, because every, each of you has a certain area of expertise that goes into specific examples of decoding or coding. And I I, I'd like us to start with hieroglyphs, the Rosetta Stone anniversary, stuff like that. So the end of the <laughs> OK, David. So that, that sounds good to me. Well, actually, I mean, the, 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 the ancient languages and scripts that I mainly deal with are not the hieroglyphic ones from Egypt, but those from the Near East, and especially the first uh, system of writing ever invented in world history, the cuneiform writing system. And there we see in, you know, around 3200 BCE, the invention of a writing system that's quite different from what we currently use, the alphabetic writing system, but, but it's a system that mixes together uh, signs, multiple signs that indicate words or parts of words. Now one of my the things that I'm very interested in is actually what that did to the people's perception of the universe in which they lived, because uh, in the way they conceived of the writing system and the way they conceived of the elements of the writing system, it was not in order to reproduce speech, but it was in order to reproduce reality uh, and reality expressed in writing. And because it's very different from the way we perceive writing in our alphabetic script, where let's say each character has one 
particular value or as only a value within the context of the other characters. Uh, but it's always, let's say, a letter B has always something to do with the labial in pronunciation in speech. Each character has multiple values, values that can sound entirely different from one another, but also that can have different meanings altogether. And what you see happening in this cuneiform script is actually that they play around with the written form of anything, a name or a sentence or something like that, and they reinterpret it using various meanings of the various elements. Obviously, this is not the case for basic writings, but this is when you talk about scholarly text, ritual text, that type of thing. So you can take actually a particular sequence of signs and give them one meaning. And actually, if you give each of these signs a different, you know, differently play around with it, you can actually come up with exactly the opposite. Mm. To it. So you get this, which seems to be, to us, extremely confusing, but actually to them there is a coherent system that enables you to interpret things and then get an understanding of, of anything in the universe through its written form. Well, would you say that there's a, more of an emphasis, it's, it's slightly less abstract and more material? It's so the, the material nature of the image of these... Uh, no, it's actually nothing. It's, it's, though it's a very visual system of writing, uh, the, 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 the basic and to us difficult thing to understand is that actually each element within this system has multiple values. And if you... Obviously there's an apparent and immediate understanding when you read something, but if you really want to, to discover the full truth, the full value of something that is expressed in writing, you have to consider these other options. And so you can take a particular name and you can then interpret that name. I, I mean, when I said you can interpret it entirely in the opposite, um, that's, that, it does happen, but that's perhaps too extreme. But you can actually see in the name of an individual, or let's say of a god, you can find within that god's name all aspects of the powers that that god has in the universe if you read that name properly. How, uh, uh, how did you feel decode cuneiform? How would you decode this? Yeah, how did you understand what uh, the, these various meanings that each of these uh, well, sometimes they, they give us this information. Luckily, I mean, we have, I mean, they have scholarly material where they, in a sense, look back upon their own writings and, and give interpretations of their own writings. There's a long textual tradition that goes of some 3,000 years. And so we benefit from the fact that, especially in the later periods of this history, there are people who are looking at texts that have been produced in the past and who make commentaries on these texts. And so there, within these commentaries, we can see how they could take certain passages and look at these passages and give them various interpretations. So you're saying that there's, there's an unbroken tradition in Mesopotamia, which is very different than the broken tradition in Egypt. Well, no, this doesn't go into the modern era. Actually, the, the, the interesting thing, so this system... So you did have to rediscover how so to... So we had to rediscover uh, it in the 19th century of the Common Era. It was rediscovered, and it wasn't... I mean, it was already an accomplishment, let's say, to be able to read these cuneiform texts, because it wasn't as easy as with the Egyptian hieroglyphs, where you had the Rosetta Stone, mm -hmm. which gave you... Uh, and, you know, an ability to understand these hieroglyphic signs, but it was accomplished. The ones we, you know, people were able to read this text also that became able to, scholars became able to read more complicated text and figured out that they, they themselves indicated sometimes, well, although you have this particular passage, that passage actually 
can have multiple meanings or we can explain the meanings that that passions have by looking at how it is written out, not by how it is pronounced. So, let's start with the basics. Okay. Coding is an agreement between the sender and the receiver. It requires a cipher. Without the cipher, there is nothing. So information is not out there, it's not in the sender, it's not in the receiver, it's a relationship. The information should be packaged and anybody who learns the Morse code knows that packaging is very important because the stop signs, or in computer language or in, in, uh, in human languages, you have to have uh, methods to say this is the beginning, this is the end of the message and this is the asset which we call cipher. Without a cipher you can never break the code. You know? Champagnon mm. <laughs> uh, could decode the hieroglyphs because he was given the cipher, the Rosetta Stone. And uh, that grounded an unknown language to two known languages mm -hmm. that he spoke. He spoke like ten languages of yes, Mediterranean. Yes, 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 yes. He, was, he was equipped with the, with the way to discover things, all my credit is to him, but without Rosetta Stone he would have no clue. Um, let's see another example, you wanted to have examples. Uh, uh, Alan Turing is well known, to know he is the, break code, uh, the code breaker. In fact, he didn't break the code, he couldn't. The code, that is the cipher, was given to him by the Polish intelligence service in 1939 by the, the Polish post office because they already had an Enigma machine. Actually, he got two Enigma machines. The Enigma machines contained the, 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 the key elements of which you had to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate the same uh, uh, method both Champollion used and, and many other code breakers used. Now, in the brain, <laughs> you know, we usually read every single cognitive science paper that the brain codes information. This is nonsense because there is no information out there. Information is always a relationship between what's out there and, and what is uh, inside here. So, actually, without humans, I challenge you is that there is no information. We make things out there and keep it as information because we know and or we create the ciphers. Now this is very general, you get the fantastic uh, particular examples. I'm, I'm uh, interested in this possibility though that this modern understanding of decoding, let's say where there's a, where there's a, uh, uh, a, key? a key, yeah thank you, that um, the, the definition of coding then gets to be, well, the, if you know the code, you know how to proceed to try to unpackage a certain sort of information. We call right. it decipher. Right, right. decipher, right, right. But we, I think, now have this idea that it's a way to be able to know how to speak the words, to just say them out loud. But I think earlier on, it wasn't just simply a matter of turning it into an oral uh, format. Right? Is that fair to say that it, that wasn't exclusively but what it was about? That's, 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 that has that's what it's exactly become. So when I let, like to send a message, I can do it various ways. Animals can do it. By the way, you know our obsession is about the human mind is just a, a very narrow uh, kind of an approach. Because when you generate an artifact, it is a message to somebody else, and the advantage of an artifact that it will survive you and it can be given to many, many. So it's a one-to-many communication and forever. And it's very easy to identify human artifacts. When you go in the desert or anywhere, you find anything, you say, this is natural or this is a, a human-made. Because we are sensitive to those things that are required, the human mindset and, and its uh, ability to construct things. So that kind of, uh, of message is what was, uh, I'm sending messages all the time with my eyes and my, my, my gestures and so on, language was an extraordinary human <laughs> invention. And of course, when language occurred, then some of these guys around the table, including me, were very valuable because the elder people were the ones who accumulated all that knowledge and carried the information. But when writing was invented, that was huge. And then 
books were invented, that was huge. And so on. But it's basically an externalization of brain function. It's, it's sending messages to the receivers. Yeah. But this is, so there are, this is something that, that irritates me a lot. There are a lot of people in my, in, in my field to study so the origins of writing, and who seem to, who say, state actually explicitly it was not a big deal. Because as you're saying, there's a system of communication pre-written or even in parallel with writing, a system of communication through visual images, etc., or through objects and so on. And they're saying, well, writing is just a, a similar thing, parallel, and it doesn't really affect the brain to, to beyond that what you've been saying. In my opinion, it seems that one, the, the invention of writing had an a, a very radical impact on the functioning of the human brain and that it made the human brain function differently but I'm not, of course I'm not like you are a specialist in this <laughs> uh, that it made the human brain function differently well, what Absolutely. about people that don't read uh, 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 yeah, yeah thank you please no just because I, I work yeah. Uh, the materials that I work on from antiquity are not necessarily, I sort of yeah. look at text, but I also look at images because in antiquity, as well as modernity, not everybody could read and write. Yeah. So the fact that you have these amazing cuneiform texts, whether they're just like receipts of things or, or more extended ones, it still requires specialization to be able to, to be able to um, carve those figures in those particular ways and to have that vast information at hand and to be able to read it and process it. But surely, I mean, not everyone in Mesopotamia could do that. So for those who were able to engage in the very specialized elite activities of the production of these texts, surely it changed how they thought and it sort of had a ripple effect on how society is organized. But for many people who couldn't engage in those things, right, it took um, until literacy, however broadly we describe it, becomes more widespread. I think it, it probably, it, it's true. I mean, the way brain function might have developed would be different in accordance with the relationship to those systems, I imagine. There are actually experiments in, in India that are more illiterate than needed. And the people who were enrolled in a two-year school, they were monitored with fMRI mm -hmm. and they show changes all over the brain almost. It's mm -hmm. hard to point, you know, this is not a Wernicke and the Broca areas, eh, everywhere. But the remarkable thing, I think this is what we have to realize, that our communication or, or cipher system is based on a generative grammar. That is, of course, part of the, the, the spoken language, but when it was written, the key thing is that how humans figured out in all cultures 20 to 35 elements, letters, to describe the entire knowledge of humankind. I mean, that's an extraordinary achievement. And of course, it was not designed. There were no smart people, just the general smart people, and, and it evolved. And, and that's that's uh, something that you can call human invention because no other species achieved that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still it's stuck, absolutely. though. Uh, okay. I think what you're saying is very provocative. But I'm thinking that. Um, if Homer couldn't read and write, and Muhammad famously could not read or write, or do you think their brains are working differently? Yeah, I do so, think so. You so think absolutely. Muhammad, who wrote, uh, essentially wrote the, the or, or Homer that yeah. wrote all this wonderful material that survives for thousands yeah. of years, he to but he didn't Homer. write, yeah, but he didn't, oh, me too, but he didn't, and it was all sung. Right? And, 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 and the Quran rhymes, and, and no wonder people remember it. But still, I mean, it, it became written, but it wasn't written by them. Uh, but they did. Christ didn't write his stuff yeah. down. And, and yet, you're, so you're saying that there was this big transition in a way from, from, from uh, Muhammad to uh, whatever, I forgot the name, the person, the scribe that started, that started writing the Quran down. They, they would have two different kinds of brains. Yeah, but, but okay. actually, right. you're focusing. I mean, unfortunately, also you you're focusing too much on the on the alphabetic writing system. Mm. And there, this is this, 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 the, the the issue of the relationship between the oral and the written. And the purpose of the alphabet is to represent the oral. Okay. Therefore, Socrates thought that writing was actually a, a bad thing because it took you one step further back from truth. Okay. 
What I'm saying, or what I'm arguing, is that actually the cuneiform writing system and the hieroglyphic writing system for that matter, they're not alphabetic. And certainly in the cuneiform, which I know very well, it's not, the intention is not to render speech. The intention is to render something, reality, in writing. Yes, you can make a connection to speech, but actually perhaps initially it was not even connected to speech. Initially, it may be just as I mean, the earliest text we have, there is no clear connection to speech. It is not a rendering of speech, it is rendering of reality in a written form. That then adjusts itself, that when it becomes used to people who, with different languages, who use this script to start including more and more connections. Well, to then I think what you're saying is the big jump isn't to writing. Uh, I mean, I know I'm being a little facetious, but, but it's not your writing, it's to doing a form of writing that does reflect speech, because the re reason we remember the Iliad or the Quran or whatever is because, because they were done in written speech with rhyme and meter so that people could retain these, otherwise they would have been forgotten. I want to kind of get back to this idea that at, at the origins of spoken oratory, but then I think especially writing, there was a, a little bit of a, it meant something to people who were not good at oratory, for starts. They thought these folks who could do this, they were performers, they were special. And certainly once writing began, those who were illiterate formed this gigantic sort of penumbra around the illiterate, the literate folks. They saw a lot of these texts as being magical, but even though they couldn't penetrate it. They realized it was magical. There was something magical about it because there were experts who could derive things from it. So it's, it's wrong to think that it didn't have any impact at all on the illiterate, right? It was, it was like this group that was carried along with that. And I want to say one other thing before I forget it about the brain function, and that is there are these interesting neurological conditions like alexia, where people cannot read from stroke and other sorts of brain illness, a, a graphia where they cannot write, they often go together, they don't always go together. We know their brains are the same as brains of people before there was writing, right, primarily. Something happened, there was some transformation in their brain, but it's the same brain and it's an interesting sort of uh, mystery. For me, the perhaps fundamental distinction with early languages and early writings is that the speech is, is storytelling. It's mostly about what we call episodic memory or episodic information. That is, I'm part of the, I'm, I'm the agent who is, uh, is communicating. Whereas the early cuneiform writings were very abstract. They were all about semantics. And uh, the semanticism started with uh, counting the num number of bushels, the number of bags of uh, wheat, and the uh, number of sheep, and so on. And this is how the numbers emerged as an abstract thing, because it was a practical re uh, reflection of the activity of the humans who said, I counted sheep. Now, two years ago I was counting, doing something, and the way I counted, one, two, three, four, you know, this is how the decimal system uh, was derived and things like that. And then uh, all of a sudden it occurred to the person that uh, for, in, in Kunai forms, early Kunai forms, the ten bags of wheat has different ten than the ten sheep, because they specifically referred to the referred thing. And later on, somebody said, oh, maybe ten is something I can use in, in count anything. And that was a explicit semantic information. And later on, when the languages became more complicated, or not complicated, but more useful, then the storytelling came back also in, in written languages. But that comes, I mean, one has narrative texts relatively soon. I mean, it's relative, but the first, you know, written, I mean, you're talking about administrative texts, and indeed they're the primary, they're the first things found, but we have narrative texts, okay, 600 years later, admittedly, it's a long time, obviously. But one thing that is very important, and that's, so indeed, the administrative documents are the primary documents found in the earliest writing, but, and this to me is very important, alongside their lists of words, lexical texts, not dictionaries, but they are actually, in my reading of them, their study of the written word. So it sees it as, it's not just making 
well, what type of, of sign, cuneiform signs do we have that we can use in administrative text? But it actually takes, because they're visual signs, and it takes it and it plays around with them and come up with nonsensical signs. And they, you know, somehow they see that there is an ability to, to create something, a reality that is not connected to a physical reality and that's purely a written reality. Michael, what do you think? Well, I, I am. Um, my interests come way before language, I should say, and, and the work, but I'm very familiar with the need and the concept of cipher. On one hand, I've been working for years trying to what we call reconstruct the tree of life. And the tree of life is an evolutionary pattern uh, that now is uh, an extraordinary time, at least in the last decade and a half, that DNA sequences and the genetic code is part of that evidence to reconstruct the tree. But DNA has certain limitations. 99% of all life that ever existed on this planet is extinct. And so for those fossils, except with some very few, and my friend Svante Pabo just won the Nobel Prize, his, his work, uh, you know, in, except for those exceptional circumstances where the code has actually been recovered in human fossils or things that are uh, mammoth skin and so forth, things that are very quite young. Uh, that re fossil record is really, um, really out of the scope for DNA. So we have to rely on what actually happened and the fossils that we find. And that, as Darwin recognizes, is an incredibly inconsistent and spotty record. But you mentioned cipher, and I think what we have are cipher. We, what happens in the advance of recovering this history is the discovery of a cipher. So, and indeed, almost, it's almost a platitude. You see occasionally where someone will proclaim, oh, I have this early hominid fossil. It's the Rosetta Stone for human evolution, you know. Everything is a Rosetta. But the reality is there are. Ciphers. Once in a while, a fossil is an extraordinary cipher. For example, Archaeopteryx, the earliest bird, which shows the definitive characters of both dinosaurs and birds. And it's only through, it's only in the last five or six, well, the last decade that we've come to recognize that birds are not only related to dinosaurs, they are dinosaurs. They're just a branch of dinosaurs. In fact, they're a branch of theropods that are related to Tyrannosaurus and Oviraptor and a lot of things that we've collected in the Gobi. So, you know, that's our cipher. The, it was a combination of characters which was recognized by Richard Owen in the early 20th century. He said, hey, look, this thing has some dinosaur-like characters. He didn't go much farther than that. Then uh, John Ostrom at Yale went a little further, and then people like Jacques Cotier and Mark, my colleague, really, you know, expanded on that. And so it's, I think we're always searching for ciphers, you know, in, in the fossil record. And there aren't too many. <laughs> there aren't, you know, it's, it's a very rare event. That's why there's so much attention paid to it. I think speaking for the audience, can you say a little bit more about why birds are dinosaurs? That's really pretty <laughs> yeah. intriguing. Well, the, the skeletal structure of a, a if you, t as, as Richard Owen observed, if you strip that archaeopteryx skeleton of, you know, it's preserved in this incredible way in the Jura limestone with impressions of feathers. And if you strip that off, uh, this animal, it looks like a small theropod dinosaur. And it, its hip structure, the orientation of the pubis, the, uh, the lower limb and the feet, very, very characteristic of a subgroup of dinosaurs, the theropod dinosaurs, with the long claws and the extended uh, uh, digits on, on the foot, and, an, and a whole variety of other characters. So, um, and of course, we discovered in 1993 with this very ex incredibly rich site in the Gobi, and in a way, this site, which we named Ukatogat, the whole site is a cipher because um, it's preserved hundreds of skeletons of dinosaurs, little mammals, and lizards. And 
compared to what we have and what we found in Mongolia, uh, in North America, a lot of those animals, especially the smaller ones, are represented only by isolated teeth and jaws. We knew nothing about what they looked like as whole animals. We called those fossils spare parts because, you know, you have to put everything together. Well, we discovered that these uh, oviraptors were nesting. We discovered the first nesting dinosaurs, and they were on a clutch of eggs, and the eggs were always in an architectural arrangement. Mm. And these, these dinosaurs were capable, just like bear, uh, birds, of parental care of their nests. So there was once in the, there's, there's a window open to dinosaur behavior that we never expected to find. Once again, that kind of, and once again, reinforcing the relationship between these dinosaurs and, and living birds. Just to amplify this point, that how important it is to have a key or a cipher. Mm -hmm. uh, the ciphers lead to game-changing ways. It leads to changing the framework through which we see the world. As an example, uh, Ari Bergson, a philosopher, introduced a term called Alain Vital. Nobody knows, the young people don't know what I'm talking about. Alain Vital was the most debated critical thing in the two centuries ago, because it was impossible to explain or conceive how from a seed you can make a tree or from uh, a woman's sperm you can make a human. There must be a driving so Elan Vital is a drive of life. And it, it led nowhere. All of a sudden, DNA came around. It was a game changer. Nobody talks about Alain Vital anymore. Everything is explained because we shifted to a different framework from where things are explained in a self-explanatory manner. Well, precisely, Darwin had uh, his theory of natural selection as solid, but his mechanism for it is completely wrong because he didn't have that cipher. But I want to make a point about ciphers because the cipher you referred to earlier, Yorgi, about uh, the Rosetta Stone was an explicit, like, this equals this, that mm -hmm. equals that. There are some, there has been deciphering that's going on. Here, clearly, there's no key. There's no explicit key in what mm -hmm. you're doing in paleontology. Um, there are other methods that people have to try to make some sense of, what's, of decoding what is going on. So there's frequency, the chronology, things of that nature, and also, Am I wrong about this? So linear B also was uh, decoded without an explicit key. Yeah, it was decoded. I mean. Right. Frequency of, of the appearance of certain uh, units, elements in the language is used as a mm -hmm. kind of a way to build up a key. Yeah. Right. How, how often in the information being imparted does, well, in English would be the letter E appears much more than other letters, the letter Z not very much, except in your name. <laughs> and mine, it, it's, it's part of it because everything in nature is log normally distributed. We are just at the right end of this skewed distribution. <laughs> exactly. No, but those sort of frequency analyses and uh, chronologies do help to build up a sort of a key, which doesn't necessarily well, which is the best we can do. But, but in order to do so, don't you need to have a, 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 an understanding of the general structure? Because indeed, the letter E is more. Is more common than the letter Z within the structure of English. English. And so those, with that those that, are frequent, yeah. that are frequently used are not really changing or changing much slower over the time of uh, humankind. So in a, in a given language, when uh, you are looking for common words in Finno Ugric, for example, uh, then we have a bunch of words that are very basic and frequent, were frequently used over centuries, such as blood, fingers, and so on. And the rare words are changing meaning a lot. Many Greek words are used today in a totally different connotation, like empathy. Everybody else was empathy. Is in the real use in Greek is called disgust. <laughs> and so, so we, we, all these transformations happen because of the way how we use language in everyday life. And these numbers or the frequency distributions are very important tools to dig out what are the common and what are the 
the unique elements of changing language. Also, I think you need a context for interpreting the key to recognize that key. So I, just thinking back, forgive me about the fossil record, um, there had to be, someone had to present the idea that these things took place over enormous amounts of time. And that was a huge controversy. There wasn't evidence directly for the age. We didn't have radiometric dating or anything like that. There was basically a concept of time with you know, that being in this enormous expanse. And it was rejected by most intellectuals of the time until it finally took hold. So you needed some kind of context to interpret even those fossils, those ciphers. People were finding fossils during that time and you know, thinking that maybe they were casualties that didn't make it on the ark. So, you know, the the you had to have some kind of context for interpreting the ciphers in, in the beginning, in the first place. And I appreciate the sort of to imagine it as a type of patterning too. I mean with, with the types of materials that I work on and the way that I work on them, there is no cipher because I'm approaching it from sort of a a cultural angle, so some of these things resemble letters and some of these things resemble pictures. But it's really just paying attention to the precise spatial context and sort of broader practical context and looking at patterns in their distribution that enables us to sort of create some sort of framework of interpreting them because otherwise there is no interpretation. It's not, you know, they're not words to represent something necessarily. What are those texts that you're referring to? Um, a lot of my research is on uh, graffiti in Aramaic or Greek um, in Syria and late antiquity or the Middle East and ways in which, I mean, to sort of harken back to as you described it, these, these ways that people produce artifacts, we just don't know necessarily what they're trying <laughs> to communicate sometimes, except the, the patterns in their distribution can be helpful if they're graffiti in burial caves or um, in places of prayer or worship or something like that. But these are humans who might not have been able to uh, write a record of how many sheep or how many, well, maybe if it was a very limited vocabulary, they could, but they're trying to express something. I mean, they're, they're trying to commemorate a moment, an idea, and it's sort of trying to get a sense of what, why they're creating this sort of artifact of presence or ideation or something like that. How do you know you are right? I don't. So, because that's the, without the cipher, you have a consensus approach. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a wonderful expression at Burning Man that I you often use that reality or the truth is what we all dream about together. <laughs> that's a wonderful expression, except it's useless because everything that we would like to define has to be grounded one way or another. I have to communicate that grounding to any to other cultures because other you know, your classific or any classification can happen only from a point of view, from a classifier's point of view. Mm -hmm. you now we have we can be classified in millions of ways. Uh, you know you have got beard, uh, we have got short hairs, and so on. Um, you have <laughs> that's that's being <laughs> kind. Thank you. So so th that kind of classification is useful, and then somebody comes with a different framework and said. For sure. But then you could say, well, then what do we do? Do we just no, no, neglect no, 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 I, I, I Absolutely. I think that's why it's important to, you know, to yeah, produce understand. or record your own framework of interpretation. And people can Perfect. As long as we know that we are in For a sure. temporary particular mindset, then it's, it's, then it's okay. And this yeah. should bring us to time because <laughs> you, you just mentioned that people don't have, didn't have the concept of very long time. Because human perception and animal's perception is based on the skewed rule that 10,000 years for me is the same as a million years mm -hmm. or a trillion years. I, I, there is no way well, I can... I to, when I was a boy, as a kid, I was obsessed by this issue. I just didn't understand how you could understand time. And my parents took me to the Grand Canyon and I said, oh, wow, I think I finally got it because this is this immense place, you know. And it starts the bottom of the canyon is Precambrian rock. It goes back billions of years. And then it goes to the top. 
And then I realized the youngest rocks in the canyon were 200 million years old, the stuff at the top. <laughs> so there was even more. And I said, I just, I can't wrap my head around that. And I, I still think even though we can date those rocks and even though we can uh, recover these lost communities and so forth from uh, eons ago, I still think we don't quite perceive what that means. We don't was, know what was a that young means. boy was somebody like humans 200,000 years ago. We had a vague concept of space and time, which right. meant that we are nobodies in this universe, just tiny little things, and yeah. there is this huge thing, These and stars, there is this eternity, yeah. and things like that. Science approached it, well, uh, space and time became scientific concepts as anything else when we started measuring them. Right. So space was replaced with distance, time was replaced with duration, and then we came to an agreement with measuring instruments such as the rod and clocks. Without such externalization of brain function and a, a universal agreement on things, space and time is nothing. And if you can continue the discussion, I will explain you that there is no space and no time. But, mm. uh, but, but and indeed, once you started to look at that, those stratifications, those are concrete. Those yeah. could be looked at. Yeah. And then you look at the physical process of not you, but geologists that said the evolution of this is this long according to biometric. Then you have an agreement. Well, Lyle, you know, looked at those rocks and then he went down well, to I, a I, beach I, I, or a river. And he said, well, wait, I can see in these rocks, these pebbles streaming out. I can see these things forming. Now let, let's see how long that takes. And he went out on the beach and nothing happened. He could sit there for a month. And then he saw a little bit of sand, you know, mm -hmm. being uh, deposited on a sandbag. And so he said, hey, this takes a huge amount of time to create what you see here in this rock record. See, I want to I wanna go back to something Karen just said earlier, and you challenged a little bit, Jordi, is about how do you know, how can you confirm what you're seeing when you look at these archaeological things and you said, well, it's true, it, a, a consensus gets built. Um, and you tell your story and your account the best you can, and then you wait to hear what sort of other colleagues and experts in the field think, and you slowly build it up. Okay, to me, that's what language is also to. Isn't language a consensus? We think language itself forms as some sort of social thing. Everyone agrees that we're going to use the word red wrote whatever the original red was, that we all kind of get into this consensus. And interestingly, that seems to give the semantics to meaning, right? So you can say, well, what you're doing right now seems to be uh, a little inchoate, maybe, at worst. I don't think it is, but you know. And then it, maybe it'll come closer and closer as consensus, and it might go down the wrong path. The consensus may lead us in the wrong direction. And that's, that's just what you're dealing with. But I think there's something lost in that because the, the next topic I'm interested in talking about is, well, is there anything lost in changing to the thinking of things being all a code? Like, do you miss something? Because it's reductionistic to a degree, right? You, know? you, you, you will miss tons of things because, uh, again, we, 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 we are human and language chauvinistic. But we can look at the same problems with a different direction. So semantics or explicit knowledge can be derived in all animals one particular way, which is my own experience. So one, I have one, one experience, I have another experience, another experience, these are all concrete. And from those interactions or intersections of those experiences, something becomes explicit. That is, the events are stripped off from this spatial temporal Traditions and it be, they become explicit. When I've seen a first dog in my life, it's an, it's an episode, it's an experience. I see another dog and another dog, and, and then I created the, the, the explicit knowledge of dogness, and I know what it is. Now, this is fantastic. Humans with language have another way of producing semantics, which is things are given to you by an authority, such as your parents, such as your teachers, and so on, and said, uh, this is a USB, this is an iPhone, 
and I can use it because I was told about the utility of that thing. And it goes along for a long time and, and I have no reason to contradict it, even though I don't know what's in USB. I don't even know what USB stands for. I just know what this is. So humans can give, they, they, you know, there's a little funnel here and then you are pouring a lot of knowledge into the head of a newborn or a, a, a child because we can do, and, and people who cannot generate episodes in their lives, there are people without hippocampal systems, they still can get around because they have this enormous freely given uh, semantic information. The catch is this, because it's not your experience, you don't go through the verification process, you don't ground those things, and then I start believing that I'm a good Democrat because this is my framework, or I'm a good Republican because this is my framework, and I never questioned my framework because that was given to me. I never questioned those words that were given to my teacher, my priest, or if I have one, or, or, um, or, or authorities. So that's an interesting thing, and that's why I say that when we split things to its or carve nature by its joints, and we are trying to go, this is the only time when we have to think about them seriously. For everyday parlance, it's not a big deal. In our culture, it's not a big deal when we are classifying this and that. But when we are going to the roots of things, then this is the key to think about, and this is the absolutely needed approach for space and time as well. I'm going to go back with this issue of language, because I, mean, I forget the exact term that he uses, but Noam Chomsky's idea about linguistics is totally different from what you're saying. It's not something that is taught to us, language is not taught to us, but language is somehow inherent into the human being as a species. I'm afraid I can't, I mean, I hope I'm not talking about something that is totally alien to you. I thought you Oh, no, no, you just brought up a can of worms that's yeah. going to go way longer than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should have not seen Yeah, that. no, I, I mean, happy to get into that, but... Um, maybe briefly? Really briefly? I mean, I, for me personally, in my own work, I sort of dismiss all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, there are all forms of animal communication that have nothing to do with those rules. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then it becomes, for me, very, very arbitrary mm -hmm. about what we call language, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, you know the Konstolbachikov studies? Have you ever read these no. things? These mm -hmm. are fantastic. This is this fellow, uh, he just retired, but anyway, he's, he, he studies prairie dog communities in the, uh, Arizona. And the different communities have different calls. Uh, to us, they just sound, they're, they're 100 milliseconds, right? And so to us, they all sound the same. But if you simply record them uh, and, and slow them down, you find out that they have, they have, a, they have different meanings. One of them will mean um, the coyotes coming from that direction. They, he even did experiments with graduate students wearing different color t-shirts, and they were able to assign the a different call to each of the colors that the graduate mm -hmm. student t-shirts wore. Mm -hmm. And they were able to distinguish one of the graduate students in a different way, even if she should, because she was shorter than all the other ones. Those mm -hmm. useful graduate students. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he would do things like shoot a rifle, he'd shoot a rifle off on the side, and then they would develop a new vocabulary for that. That's amazing. So, yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic, it's great work. And is it, is it language? But in this case, right, isn't, it, isn't that analysis based on looking at an ex a stimulus and then the frequency of the response. Like it's, it's a little bit of a syntactical analysis because you're talking about the formal aspects of those sounds. Right? We don't know, and, and that's exactly what we do when you try to decode a script that we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's inconsistent with, Ch I'm not a Chomsky fan either, but I happen to think that's not inconsistent. You could say, well, Chomsky would say, yes, but in humans, the way language forms, the formal aspects, the syntactical aspects, have a certain form, and we can rely on that to do an analysis exactly. of the difference. So he would exclude that as yeah. a language, mm -hmm. and I just, oh. uh, I just frankly stay out yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the word language, yeah. like when you're referring to prairie dogs or dolphins he or would. something. You see, you you would. Would. Well, I would use communication, but mostly because I don't want to get down that road of defining what language no, is. Yeah. Because to me, okay, this yeah. is what I really think. 
I think that a lot of a lot of academics like to use language as a way to um, uh, differentiate our species from all other species. Yeah. Right. And, and so I just don't want to. I don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah. I think it's a waste. For me personally, it's a waste of time. I don't think anybody has that. Um, there are very few language chauvinists who said language is completely human. Yeah, but no M does. Uh, he still says it. He still ago, says it now. Ago. No, Yuri still says it now. Okay, I saw. I, yeah, I know. But then he has a lot of followers in different departments. You know, I just. I mean, it's just. It's. Just, it's, it's like you were saying. Some. Some. Uh, the. The what vita? It's like if we were still arguing about about getting the uh, the homunculus from the semen into the. You know, into the egg. I mean, it's just. It's just something I want to put aside. Yeah, I agree. He's as a prominent person, but I think. Any linguist would agree that communication is a better, perhaps more general word, and and I can communicate with my dogs, my my, my cats, and there's no question that we communicate or they communicate with each other. Do they have syntactical rules? Yes, they have. Do they have the same language genes? And we know that birds have also, some birds have similar genes. That was a huge discovery. Well, two decades ago. The and there, there is nothing without evolution. There is nothing in the brain that doesn't have a precedence, even the most complicated things like consciousness. Everything is that. Do French dogs communicate differently than American dogs? Different language? Uh, so that's an interesting thing that brings me back to my, my, uh, my what was it, the funnel that we put a lot of stuff into our brains is because, interestingly, there is a big skis for humans, or big discrepancy between knowledge of humankind and the individual's share. My share of humankind's knowledge is extremely ridiculous, and it's getting worse and worse and worse, obviously, every day. Now, dogs, from anywhere, they have pretty much the same knowledge of dog kind anywhere in the world. Do they have a cultural differences by <laughs> there might be the localities do are there are there cultural inheritances in animals yes there are there are known monkey groups in okinawa these are rhesus monkeys they wash potatoes and once that that tradition is gone then perhaps it's gone forever and we know that there are many cultures that that like uh, the Tasmanian cultures, like the, the, the Icelandic cultures and the Greenland cultures, they all disappeared because the people who had the knowledge died and then they, 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 they couldn't make new canoes, they didn't make like, arrows and things like that. All of a sudden that civilization just was disappeared because of the, the lack of this knowledge. I, want to, I have to tell this story is mostly because it's amusing, and I want to move away from having this roundtable devolve into a talk about animal consciousness, which we love to do here at Helix, but we're going to... Uh, <laughs> this story, which may be a good segue, is there was a study about cats looking into whether cats uh, understood their names. I think this is just a wonderful story, so... You know, as opposed to other words that they might hear. Mm -hmm. So they do an MRI of the cat, and they stimulate, call the cat's name, and sure enough, the researchers found, yes, cats can distinguish their name from other words spoken to them. They just don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really funny, but it does say something about, well, what does, what, what then do you do? Let's say, let's say the cat's decoded tabby. It's decoded it. Some part of his brain, anyway, seems to ev evidence that, that it's been decoded. But then what does the cat do? do with that code is there that creates a meaning for the cat right no i love that story because they really don't give a damn and it's very interesting to me to be around people that are trying to decode for instance uh the the this the seti group which is you, you probably have read about this yeah, so they're trying to yeah, decode yeah. The, the the whale song by doing deep oh. learning and and the fellow running it says well we just need more data that's all we need <laughs> and it's it's nonsense frankly i mean uh, god bless them for doing that and i'm glad somebody else is doing it <laughs> But, but, the, uh, um, but Roger Payne, the fellow who discovered whale song, he tried to, you know, th and he's done over 50 years of, of following the whales and, and interacting with them as well as we can. Right. 
And he was trying to imagine what the conversation would be. And the conversation would essentially be, okay, uh, where's the food now? And I'm tired of smelt. Okay. You know, give me, give, give me, line, give me, give me octopus. I'm tired of smelt. And that's the kind of, and I also, this also reminded me of conversations with Oprah Chernovsky, who, who you probably know is a bird scientist. And he says, you know, he spent his life around these songbirds. And he says, you know, they, they really think we are very slow. I mean, we can't, we can't possibly catch them. And we're very stupid. And the stuff that we worry about is, is just nonsense. <laughs> and, and I think that's right. I think we're going to put a, 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 He's absolutely right. And yeah. you are right what you're saying. In, in our field, cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience, we make this mistake all the time because of our inheritance. That is, we are giving the world to the brain. We are recording from the, the brain something such as firing or fMRI signals. And then we find a relationship and we think, we are decoding the brain, and you herald it in New York Times. The fact is that that message is message only for an outside observer, because only the outside observer has the luxury of seeing the outside world and what's happening in the brain. Neurons in the brain have no clue. They don't know if there is anything outside there. The only thing they have is the activity there. So what comes into the world, that has to be grounded. It has to be connected to something that something else, it has a, you have to have a second opinion. The only thing that is available for the, for the brain, that, that is for us as humans, also is through our actions and our uh, verification of things. Unless those are, the, the, our things are verified independently, everything is just a consensus. And that doesn't really help us at all. So, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, Communications, the brain's birth song. We, are, we use a lot of imagination, but that has to be looked at. And I can give you many, many examples that there are tons and tons of misunderstanding. Once you start recording from the brain and you ask whether those patterns that we thought were representing these things actually mean something to the brain, if you don't have that grounding knowledge, you know nothing. Right. Well, a good way to think about that would be, and this goes, returns to Shannon's discussions about information, you know, and he made a very strong effort to say, look, this is not information in the sense of like knowledge. It's not meaning. It's just how do you get the code. There's a code for the information, right? And it's interesting just imagine a signal comes across a wire or the airwaves and it's the word dog, right? Okay, dog. Now, that's wonderful. I heard it. It's the word dog. Now, why is it then, then, if I want, I can go to the library or I can think of myself, I could write an essay on dogs about all of my experiences and thoughts about dogs. I could write a poem. I could make a song. I could write a song about dogs, right? And so, and those individual expressions of mine will be, I hope, rich and elaborate, and it goes well beyond just the single word dog that the information came along, but it doesn't have the full richness of dogness for, for me, right? And I think that's an important... But it has the issues of you. Yeah, yeah. Because you represent... Right, but the, but, the, but the code only provides a key to triggering. That's sort of what you're saying. There's a context into which these codes, you know, find them, insert themselves. And then the rest has to do with the way the humans respond to it. That's why I was saying earlier, if an if a illiterate looks at a writing, especially, I think, back in the... Uh, in the ancient times, it would have a very strong meaning to them, although it was not the explicit meaning that the code seemed to be trying to convey. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, back to the yeah. notion of the cipher, you know, uh, to, to my mind, uh, I think what ciphers are, they are the means of falsifying consensus. So, and there's so many classic examples of that. I mean, plate tectonics, everybody thought continents didn't move. And even though there was a concept for moving continents, it wasn't really, it didn't really falsify consensus until, uh, uh, as examples of real science brought up here, um, paleomagnetic reversals, uh, patterns on the ocean floor showed actually that the ocean seafloor was spreading and these continents moved. So that, that happened almost a century after the concept of continental drift. 
Uh, so the cipher, the key was paleomagnetics, and it falsified what most scientists believed at the time. And the Russians still, some of the Russians still believe that continents don't move, but hmm. that's but here an exceptional community. I mean, I think we have to be very, agree. There are, all, there are these paradigm shifts, I think. And we should, I mean, I think we shouldn't be too arrogant into believing that now we have found the absolute <laughs> truth. Oh, no. And yes. that next century or next year, you will find some, you know, some other revelation Absolutely. that will create a different... I'm, a in, totally a, different, you know. I'm in a field with violent arguments yeah. about this because I keep encountering and, and uh, in combat with, say, uh, genomics people, who say now we have the true tree yeah. we know exactly what was related to what and i'm in a school or a group of people who say we don't we may never have the the true tree yeah, very read, much like in tango what you were describing hmm? had you have you read in tango three no this is exactly about the darwin's tree and the, and today's uh, different branching and how you classify evolution in different ways. It's an extraordinarily good New York Times bestseller book. This thing it's still very good. I think one of the reasons I, well, I was interested in coding is I feel in many ways we were in this sort of paradigm of computers being the answer to everything and we're going to apply a computer model to right. understand every, every phenomenon we come across. And I thought, well, the, I, I'm interested in coding and I think it's not all a bad thing, but I feel there are some uh, a little overreach. Uh, yeah, well, it's, isn't it the case in, in, in medicine now? It's everything. Everything's genetic, isn't it? Oh, I wouldn't say that. No, but but there's a lot that's yeah, genetic. So, yeah, yeah, but then you, see, you have identical twins, which are, except for T cell receptors and antibodies, are mm. are genetically identical, and they're obviously not identical. So no, I wouldn't yeah. say. And, and yeah, some of them develop. We have ones, plenty of cases of somebody develops a disease, and, and the identical twin never develops it. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem we have in, in, in neuroscience is that we've got inbred, that is, identical twins, mm -hmm. and these are 50 to 100 generations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so embarrassing that, you know, you take 10 animals and two of them are outliers all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, still. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say, okay, maybe, pe maybe sometimes people pretend yeah. that everything's genetic. But it is sort of a paradigm. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful paradigm. Well, well the discovery but was but so exciting. Conditions there are, you can identify genes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are plenty of you, if you have uh, the Tysox gene, you know, sure. if you have sickle cell, you're, you're good. you may develop the disease at different ages, but eventually you will develop the diseases. But there are plenty of others where, where, where it will never happen. But like in paleontology, that's the, the thing too now. I mean, every, or are you talking about genome? I mean, so I mean, we're all looking at these these particular questions with a new lens. Let us say that we think enable us to create these so these geneal genealogical trees and things like that. That might, I mean, in my understanding, you know, the the whole issue of human evolution has radically changed in the, whatever, the 80s or something like that? Yeah, well, and now, but there's still a lot of arguments, even with all this new genetic information, yeah. genomic information, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of arguments about the mobility of, of Homo sapiens mm -hmm. and, and the relationship to Homo erectus and whether or not there was, you know, one exit from Africa or yeah, 25 just, exits yeah, yeah. or... It's not a field that I'm really deeply involved oh, okay. in, but but uh, even with the arrival, of, you know, and and in the areas where I work, I, I work primarily in mammalian evolution, uh -huh. and and there's there's some still some big big uncertainties and controversies in that area, even with all this gen genomic information. Some some of it's working extraordinarily, unbelievably well, and as you can tell, I'm I'm skeptical, but still, the fact that your saliva can find your second cousin yeah. in other countries is pretty oh, yeah. astonishing. It's pretty, yeah. And the fact that Google Translate is doing so well, even though it kind of cheated in some ways in the way it was, so, but it's, it's working immensely well, mm -hmm. right? You use it, probably everybody's using it. I well, wanted to ask the neuroscientists here, just say a few words about how you go about, to the degree the word decoding applies to what you're doing, 
how do you go about it? Because you're right, you don't necessarily have a key. Uh, so we do have a key. Okay. Uh, at least I claim we have a key. <laughs> and interesting that you said you are interested in mammalian evolution, so am I, but from a different aspect of, 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 of view. One of the most fascinating thing about the brain for me is that in every mammal, uh, what remains constant over the, over the evolution time is timing. That is, the brain rhythms, you may have heard about alpha, beta, gamma oscillations, and delta, and so on. These are not only individual ones, but they form a hierarchical system in such a way that the slow oscillations are modulating the amplitude of the faster ones, and the phase of the faster one modulate the amplitude of the even faster one. So it's, it's like the, uh, the, 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 the tide is changing, and then upon the, the changes, the amplitude of the, 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 the ocean waves are changing. Yeah. Now, uh, this is good because uh, uh, when you ask, you know, how come that you scale up a system 50,000 fold from the small brain to the size of the, the, the brain of a, of a whale, what is the rule of this evolutionary scaling? What should, be remain, what should remain constant? And what remains constant is timing through these oscillations because they are preserved. It will take 10, 20, 20 seconds. Why is that? Because this is what we call the neural syntax. This is the, these are the time packages which allow that you send information, if you want, or spiking activity from one area of the brain to another area of the brain, because the other area of the brain is already given the cipher, which is the time window. If you don't have that framework, this neuronal syntax, then brain areas cannot communicate with each other. We cannot communicate with each other. The reason why you understand me is because even though I have an accent and I have uh, make so many mistakes, is because I have a particular tempo, which is about four hertz, which is <laughs> characteristic of every single human language, which is also not only the utterances, but also the perception. And the reason for that is because both the utterances as well as the perception of these events are based on brain rhythms. So the, again, we have to go inside the brain in order to have the grounding, and that's the grounding for me, the, the, the grounding of uh, the origin of language and classification and cipher. How much of this uh, uh, formal appreciation of these constant relationships, uh, how much of it is um, a purely sort of mathematical, you know, like one over F distribution, how much does it diverge from that, and does that help you? Because, it, right, if it's very generic, if well, it's very... It, it, yeah. It's not only generic, we already know uh, the content of these patterns. And uh, there is a sh if, if something is showed, it means that in a system which has uh, constraints on the speed of communication, the brain is a very slow system. You know, the conduction velocities of the, the neurons is on the order of 0 0.2 to several meters per second. Very, very slow. So given that, if you have a short amount of time available, it means that only your immediate partners can be involved. That is, short means small number of neurons. More time means larger number of neurons. And then the whole goal of this communication is that whatever happens locally can be broadcasted globally, as well as the, the global brain state, if, you know what I, I'm, the, the activity pattern in the brain, is constrains how local communication or local uh, cipher can be, uh, can be generated. Right? If you take away the cipher, if you take away the, uh, or alter any of these brain rhythms, we end up with a, with a, every single psychiatric disease is associated with one or other type of timing problems. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to, to differentiate diseases from each other because those are all arbitrary. Mm -hmm. But it's very easy to, to look at the brain, even a, a, a depressed patient with its depressed state or non-depressed state, very different. Mm -hmm. So the timing, the communication is, is absolutely matters. And uh, 
That's what I'm, I'm pushing for, that we have a syntactical system. Well, I'm um, thinking as a, in a very general level, this idea of extracting some uh, understanding of meaning from either brain activity or artifact uh, assumes a certain sort of background. Either it could be, and there's various mathematical descriptions of it, it could be noise, it could be a 1 over f frequency. These are background, uh, you know, mathematically defined uh, substrate. And we find meaning, or we think we find meaning, when something diverges from that. Something, you give a stimulus, it's no longer, it doesn't have that baseline anymore, right? And uh, that's a way of building a key. Isn't that, isn't that in a way, when you, when you don't have a literal, you know... Uh, you, you said it absolutely right. Yeah. But then there is a deviation. This is when many brain structures kick in. And it happens through what's called phase reset. And uh, all of a sudden, the timing changes, and that timing change is detected elsewhere. If that is not detected, as happens in schizophrenia and in other diseases, that's a big problem. <coughs> oh, okay. Great. Wow. Time went fast. <laughs> all right. Um, I guess the question is, do, do we have any folks want to uh, ask questions of our panel? Not Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you all. Sorry, everyone's sitting down, so I'm going to sit down too. Hi, everyone. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, my name is Celia Emery. I'm a museum architect. And um, my concern relates to, I guess, more the politics of coding, the psychology of coding, and where agency fits in. So in museum design, we have two aspects of kind of time space. One of them is the path of the visitor in the spaces of the institution. And people enter into a building with a pre-existing idea of how they're going to use it. Because they're adults, they're free agents, and they've already learned how to use buildings. So um, museum institutions set up what that time-space experience is going to be. And yet there's a conflict, there's a schism um, within any use of any building, which is that we as individual agents want to be able to act in our own way, we want to be able to affirm. So your reference to the graffiti was so interesting. I'm about to go to um, Alula to visit the Hegra tombs. And there's a lot of graffiti. We'll talk. Um, but apparently it was speculated that that graffiti was just journeyers you know, writing down that they had arrived. In other words, I am here. Joe was here. And in fact, that isn't. That is what much of the graffiti is. So that, that kind of need for us to kind of the ego, you know, to kind of exist somewhere and market somehow within a coding system. So um, the other schism that we have is that in, um, in a museum, you have a relationship between a person and that artifact, which was created in a different point of time. So it's in a different space, it's in a different time. So how do we, so there's two different aspects of this. I'm going to get to this point. In epigraphic and cuneiform, the who was control, my question for the group is really, who has the control of these forms of ideology? Who is creating, who is, who is benefiting from the cuneiform methods? Why? And who was benefiting from written language and why? How come cunef that didn't continue to exist? And then how do we as individual agents kind of fit in? Like, aren't we, are we just obeying the you know, ideological precepts that have been handed down to us, or do we have any agency within coding? Well, let me start with the specific question of so who benefited from cuneiform. You can have a very materialistic interpretation, and that's the usual interpretation. It's a, you know, it's a way of dealing with a more complex system of especially economic interaction, therefore you need some type of record keeping uh, that goes beyond time and space that, you know, can be, you know, can either can travel from one place to another place or is kept for a specific period of time. Um, the, to take it then to this greater level of um, that I'm, you know, when the, the writing system, well, the writing system has a meaning beyond a purely practical writing system. Well, I wouldn't call it an ideology, it's a, it's a philosophy, it's an approach to reality, 
Um, it's an, an attempt at understanding reality that, yes, is shared by an intellectual elite, just as today philosophical discourse is shared by an intellectual elite, but it frames a cultural, you know, it, it creates a cultural setting that, yes, the entire it's a civilization, if you can use that term, you know, is part of, even though a lot of the majority of people are not consciously aware of the elements of it. So. I, I just like to say that, uh, you know, one of the roles I have at the museum, and I still have, is I have oversight of exhibition. So I really understand what you're saying about what the visitor, how does the visitor engage or how does the museum engage with the visitor? And the question is, and who has agency there? And there's always, so the trend in recent years, of course, has been interactivity, interactivity, interactivity. And they're generally, many of them are experiments that fail because you make assumptions about what visitors really want. And the problem is that's based on you, your opinion. You're not the visitor, you know? And uh, it, it's, it's fascinating just to think about who, what's happening in a museum. What happens when a visitor encounters an artifact or a fossil or a piece of uh, tapestry or whatever, in that sense? Well, I think there are just many interesting questions that you raise, and I'm very jealous of your... Um, oh, that's true. But I hope you'll put me in your suitcase. But... Um, but that said, I think it's, to me it seems very context dependent in terms of who benefits because it has to do with how communication works in individual societies. And today in a global society, working literally in code benefits very different people than um, at least uh, geographically. Um, it's it's a sort of a, more, a sense of something much more diffuse than when you're talking about individual ancient societies or medieval societies where certain practitioners were sort of deputized of being the record keepers and they could derive status from their roles as such or um, proximity to different ranges of literacy would allow people to sort of pen themselves accordingly um, in that order of status or esteem. And to go back to a point that you made earlier, I mean, this is why we literally have, we have tons of... Um, whether we call them magical texts or texts of ritual power, a lot of times they're total gibberish. Um, at least to us they seem to be, and they don't seem to accord with any particular script that we know of because it seemed like it resembled writing. To people who couldn't write, they wouldn't know the difference. And so there's a power to that. And sometimes it was just something esoteric. It was deliberately esoteric. But I think the ways in which uh, we relate to sort of dominant types of communication allows us to sort of fit into broader constructs of status, cultural, economic, and otherwise. But I think it's really sort of culture dependent. I think when we talk about antiquity, again, it's very different from today when we talk about code and coding and who's benefiting from their ability to be able to work with certain languages on computers it's, you know, many more people than 20 years ago, but who are those people, right? And how do they use that information? It's, it's something that I, I can't possibly triangulate that others might. But I think it's, it's definitely um, indicative. It's a symptom of something that's shifting in our global society that I can't interpret. But because it's, it's something sort of different, it's, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see where it goes, I guess. The key sure. phrase you have is relate. I think that's the most important thing in the museum. And I'm looking for your creations that allow me to go to a place and I lose my sense of time. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I can devote my entire mind mm -hmm. to what's going on there. Once I do that, I all of a sudden have a first point of view rather than a third person, first person point of view rather than the third person point of view of everything. Now, you asked about the agency, that I become an agent because somehow you transform me and I will be part of the participant of those events, even though I had no knowledge about that the continents go together. Mm. But, but 
I use my imagination, I use my existing knowledge, I use my existing belief systems to relate myself to that, that situation. Now, the agency is not human. It, every animal has the desire and, and everything to learn its boundaries. You know, we, we know that we have boundaries. And that's the essence of even an amoeba or every single creature that it knows that it has as boundaries and relates it to everything else. That relatedness is the super important thing. If I go to a museum where I have to interact, and this is what kids, when they go to New Jersey, the Science Museum, I see, it's the same thing as a physics class. The only plus maybe that they can do more freely and that the teacher is not watching. Mm -hmm. But this is a fascinating thing because, yes, we are always saying the museum is important. It was important to reopen mm -hmm. after COVID. Because this is a place, this is a, gives people a sense of place. But what's really interesting is for a lot of people, this is their place. Mm -hmm. This is their, and increasingly. Mm -hmm. And there might be a dichotomy in society. Maybe that'll break down as people die and younger and younger people come up. But mm -hmm. you can see it in a, you know, in, a, in a daughter or somebody close to you that you know intimately how, what their reality is mm -hmm. compared to, you know, what you're trying to do with visitors coming to a museum. That's a, just that, really so two, two examples that work for me very well. Of course, it requires the relatedness. Uh, the Japanese Shinto gardens, there is, it's simple, but you lose the sense of the time immediately because you are just looking at the rock. Or the other one is an extreme other things that Selena also knows about, the, you know, uh, Marina Abramovich when she was sitting in the, oh, uh, yeah. the boba, there was nothing, nothing there except a pair of eyes. Right. And you were looking to see yourself in those eyes. And all of a sudden, you, you had a means of saying you can discover yourself. If your museums are, your museum spaces can create that thing that discover yourself, you leave the museum with a better feeling or recreation, then but learn the love. Because the institution is the, is the organization that's you what's exactly, they want to so convey information. Story. I don't need information, I have got enough. I will <laughs> <laughs> My own personal experience, uh, which is, take it for what it's worth, I'm not a, I have nothing to do with museums, except as a museum goer. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, a lot of what makes science interesting are controversies and, and challenges within a paradigm. And the challenges within a paradigm can be small and they can be uh, on the verge of some cataclysmic change. And that's really, I think, interesting to people. It's, I would think it's interesting to people. I think it's a mistake to use the word controversy, first of all. I would stay away from that word, because I think it makes people think, well, there are experts. And that, you're already distanced from it if you say there are experts. And the word controversy, for my, personally, for myself, sort of is off-putting. It makes it seem like this is a little bit going to be beyond me. I think it's really useful to say here that you know, just lay out the different ideas side by side and don't refer to it as being some raging uh, um, controversy among experts. Well, I just want to express appreciation for everyone who does this work and it partly relates to the fun. Yeah. Because I found, and this is also relating to what you asked before, is there a difference to humans between something that's a million years ago or 10,000 years ago? And I, I find that with my students, anything that happened before the year 2012 is ancient history. Mm -hmm. right. The time is completely compressed. Right. And obviously my students are not as, they're not working in the same capacity. If you were to work with graduate students or in your field or you with yours or you with yours, right? Because they're already very much aware of, of, of the stretch of time. But to me, the ways that museums have the capacity to jar people from the present reality and to force them to confront <laughs> chronology yeah. and time, whether it's, I, I feel like it's activist work these days and, and the power of losing yourself in those places, being jarred from your phone. Um, it's different when you're talking about academics or uh, researchers or specialists and the general public. I think it's one of the only places where we can remind people that there's a world beyond themselves chronologically, culturally, um, and beyond the human realm too. And I think it's, that is what I feel like is increasingly lost 
in the world of, of coding, and it's just such important work. So any way you can make people uncomfortable enough to be present in those spaces and learn is a contribution to everybody. Do your, do you, uh, uh, your students, you take your students in the field, do you notice the difference in their behavior? Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's so um, extraordinary now. Anecdotally, I mean, I, I, I teach in a history department, yeah. so not all my students uh, expect to specialize in anything that relates to antiquity. But I tell them that I, I think the tradition about museums is that, you know, it's sort of European tradition. These are places to appreciate art and being able to appreciate it in a particular way. It has to be, it's, it's a status thing, it's an appreciation mm -hmm. thing. So I tell them these are uh, libraries, are they're like visual libraries in a way. Mm -hmm. Not like, not that that's such a great advertisement for them either. <laughs> But rather than being something flat and two-dimensional, it's something you get to enter and immerse yourself into. And when it's really effective, I remember, because I teach, I teach in Brooklyn, I teach in Flatbush, mm -hmm. and some of my students have never been to the Met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember the first time when I started teaching there and I brought a class to the Met, and I remember the student who looked up the grand staircase <laughs> and he just was like, yeah, what? You know, because it's, a, it's just a different environment, a different world. And when you don't approach it as art, but you know objects that are artifacts that can teach us about different places and times that these you know that they can investigate, it's totally transformative. And it's something that a lot of people take for granted in lots of different places. But um, it, I think it's again, I think it's like a form of activism to remind people they're not the center of the universe and their phones are not the center of the universe and the world is not flat. So <laughs> sorry, that's. Thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm. Oh. Is there another question? Yeah. Question then and then question. Sure. Um, as I hear everyone talking about decoding, it, it seems to me that there's a little bit of um, sort of a an incompatibility of some fundamental assumptions, especially as I, I hear this coming out in the debate about consensus. So it seems to me that there are kind of two different approaches here to what um, decoding actually is. So I've, I've kind of like set out a number of binaries here trying to make sense of this for myself. Mm. It seems on the one hand there's a sort of a, an approach to denotation, and on the other an approach to connotation as it pertains to decoding meaning. You know, you could say that there's a kind of idea here of text versus context, or um, I guess thinking about what you were saying about the brain, a sense that there's, there's a synchrony, you called that synchrony a key, but I don't think that that's a key to meaning, that's just a condition of possibility for interpretation of meaning. So I guess I'm wondering, in this discussion of coding, one, um, whether you all would agree that there are two different approaches to thinking about what meaning is, and whether that's a disciplinary problem or something else. You ask an easy question, please. <laughs> so, you said synchrony. Synchrony is not exactly the same as, as brainwaves. But nevertheless, I didn't make a claim, and nobody does, that we can decipher the content. That's a, it's a you know, grammar has a large uh, way of defining things, but one of them is, uh, you, you, can, you can call it the phonetics of language, and that's without content. So that's what brain rhythms are about. Now, the meaning is the essential thing of everything. Unless my students show me that that relationship between what the experimenter proposed to the brain and the responses there is, has a message for the rest of the brain or to the animal, that's not, there is no meaning. So, and meaning has to be generated only through utility, at least this is uh, what the view in, in evolution as, a, as well as in, in any world, world, is that if a particular thing comes with a plus or minus in the life of the animal, that generates meaning. So many ways, uh, the way, way how today's neuroscience is, is studied, we think that it's a, a black slate, and then you just shovel information into this uh, newborn brain and so on, and you can, which means that the complexity of the brain, whatever we do, is growing as you learn more and more and more, and that's exactly what happens in an, in an AI system, and it collapses very soon because there are so much stuff that are interfering with each other. 
Another way of thinking about this is that brain comes already with an equipped dictionary. Every single thing that exists in your future life is already there. And the patterns that uh, we thought were generated de novo, in fact, they pre-exist. So what happens is that out of this realm of possibilities, you experience something that goes in one way or another, positive or negative, and that pattern that was present at the time when that experience happened becomes meaningful. It will have a utility for now or the future of the organism. This is how we generate meaning. Now, a linguist or a human person who thinks about may have another way of, of phrasing it, but I think it would be just rephrasing the same kind of thing. I'm going to drive you guys, both, both of you, crazy. I mean, to me, I'm not sure what meaning means here, <laughs> but, but there are, I mean, I, if it means something as simple as, you know, you're already talking about brain rhythms. I mean, if, I, if you stimulate uh, uh, a, uh, a synaptic input to a muscle fiber, that muscle fiber will twitch. And if you do it over here, in, in the, there's a couple of extra steps. But, you know, this muscle will twitch. And if you go over here, this muscle will twitch. And if you just go... Uh, a few, uh, you know, about a millimeter on the other side, you will hear something, or you will feel something, and in a particular part of your body. Is that meaning? Because if it is, then it's based in. Okay, so why is it not meaning? Because it has no relation to experience. Because, but what if so what? Decoding. But but it's remapping. But it has to be. It's not. It's not meaningful. It's simply a one-to-one -one relation. So I'm going to pre press you on that. It can change. It can, it, that can change. So we can, we can remap this to here instead of there. And this happens all the time when people have strokes, for instance. Would that, would, now is it meaning? I would say it would be meaningful within the context that we understand how and why it's been Okay. So I, I, think, I think we have to finish up. I, I always want both of you, but meaning <laughs> becomes. So there are things that are not there, but when you have a stroke, it becomes a meaning. So when you, when you touch your nose with your toe, <laughs> it, it feels, it has a meaning for you because it feels at the same time. Now that meaning is acquired through experience and because you feel it's at the same time and I can show you and anybody can show you that it's not at the same time. It's a much longer mm -hmm. time to go from the brain from here than from my nose. But that, for me, as a utility, I don't care about the mechanism. I just know it's at the same time. So that that's a that's a meaning for the for me because I can use that information. Anything that I can use, utility determines meaning. That's ah. a really unsatisfying discussion, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that meaning is the most <laughs> difficult concept in philosophy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have to move on, right? It's interesting. It's an interesting question, and I. But, so I've learned so much this morning, and I'm very grateful, and it has led to many different questions, but I'm just going to bring it down to one. Um, I wonder what happens in terms of when emotion enters, what happens to how people approach things? And I'm thinking now of uh, at the Morgan Museum right now, there's an exhibit on Erdogana. I'm sure you've already seen it. You've probably been talking to Sidney Babcock about yes. it. or, But... It goes from agriculture being discussed in terms of bushels, which you were mentioning, versus th handling of harvest through this highly emotive charged poem hmm. by this priestess about plow my fields, plow my fields, as an erotic situation. So I'd love to know what happens in terms of the evolution of mind that brings that in. Or the world where weary man and his basol in, in Egypt, you know, where that's a whole other, very highly emotive interaction. So are you asking within the context, I mean, <laughs> the fact that this becomes a, it's something that it's written down? No, yeah. that it, you can approach the harvest through the number of bushels. Yes. Or you can approach the harvest as a kind of analogy of the coming yeah. together of sky and earth, male and female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens 
what's what's happened in the mind that opens it up to that kind of approach? Yeah. Well, the metaphorical language, I don't know if that's... I assume it predates writing metaphorical language where we, we, we connect something physical, let's say, that's physical in one, one area of life and metaphorically we connect it to another area of life. I would imagine that that pre, pre, ex, predates the origins of writing. One of the great things about poems like the Homeric epics is how rich it is with metaphorical language. And what I find interesting about metaphorical language, like what you mentioned in the Echidwana poem, is our, metaphoric, our metaphors are contained within a cultural structure in order to make sense. So abundance of fields makes sense in a particular type of society. Actually, I discussed metaphorical language with my students only a couple of days ago living in New York City. They have no connection at all to the metaphors that are being used mm -hmm. in ancient poetry because they're mostly rural mm -hmm. metaphors. It's a, but I do, that I think is, yeah, there is a, a system there of coding as well. You have to understand, you have to understand the cipher, you have to understand the system. If I compare something to a an object, an entity, a natural phenomenon, phenomenon that none of you have ever experienced, you're not going to understand my metaphor, of course. But just also in terms yeah. of image making or expression yeah. and emotion, I think yeah. that's more what I'm wondering about, especially now with all the talk about emotion and cognition and mm -hmm. what the interaction is between them. And, and I just thought, you but know, how do you express world. emotions? <laughs> how do you render emotion in a verb, orally or in a written form. How do you do so? You can only do so, I think, by using comparison. Yeah, exactly. I mean, love is a feeling of whatever, fire, etc., etc. I, I, I think we're also going to have the opportunity yeah. to reflect on some of this issue in our the meta, uh, uh -huh. fiction, uh, fiction, metafiction talk later today. Mm -hmm. Because I think, really, for me, the answer in, in response in part to what you were asking is that there's a dialectic that goes back and forth between metaphorical, poetic sort of meaning, uh, phenomenological meaning, and then the way it gets encoded. And then the codes create the opportunity for more engagement with meaning. Because the codes themselves can have meaning. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a, a very interesting dialectic. Did you have? No. no. Oh, sorry. Hi, please. Hi. Um, this last question um, sort of uh, prompts me to, to, uh, to rise. Um, I have this thought I've been developing for a long time, and it seems to uh, coordinate with a lot of the different themes that, uh, that we've had this morning. Um, prior to the development of language, there was a great deal of intelligence in, um, in uh, early humans. They survived. And, um, and so, so do we. Um, the thought, just to make it very general, is that the evolutionary pressure, which leads eventually to the most powerful evolutionary movement, which is the development of culture, really requires the development of language. Because we have to uh, express to larger groups over time, over generational time. Um, the development of language seems to be uh, a cognitive way of thinking which is pairs of opposites, which is, um, as you say, positive or negative and so on. The metaphorical thinking is not. It's, it's more analog. Um, the earliest need for language, I want to suggest or I think, is the communication of what we would call mythic kinds of uh, ideas. It is what forms a group. It's what gives self-identity to the group. And the evolutionary pressure is in the direction of groups that are more tightly bound, more coherent. Those are the successful ones. The, so how does that happen? Evolutionarily, the thought that I have, and I don't have your expertise to know whether it makes sense to you, which is why I guess I, 
I'm saying this, is that we develop a, the brain develops a sensitivity to certain kinds of narrative that we think of as mythic. We recognize mythic ideas, mythic narrative in a different way. It's not about the content, but there is something that we feel is mythic, which would require a, a physiological development, um, evolutionarily based in the brain. And so we end up with two kinds of minds, a cognitive, which is all linguistics are cognitive, and the, the same intelligence that we had before we developed language. And those two different minds are incommensurate. They cannot communicate with each other. You can't be thinking about metaphor in a cognitive way and understand the power. Um, and if you try to translate it into cognitive forms, you lose the power. Um, and so we have these two different minds. Just as a, as, a, as a further development of that is the notion that that which can um, communicate is myth. Mythic stories, mythic ways of thinking is what gives us a sense of wholeness where we can see the world with the two incommensural uh, uh, intelligences. Anyone want to we were talking downstairs over coffee before a little bit about people who've written books that are very similar to what you're saying. And I guess you had Peter Pesek here with the polyphonic minds idea. So you might want to check out his book. Um, he kind of thinks the way that you do. And we were also talking about the, the bicameral mind, which is very out of fashion. But do you know that book? The bicameral mind, yes, I've read many years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's very similar. To what, exactly. It's very, very similar to what you're bringing up. Uh, now, I'm very skeptical of both of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm friendly with Peter, you know, but, but still, I'm very skeptical. I, I think they take a lot of impressionistic kind of stuff and try to come up with the whole theory. But, and, and just like I'm being a little skeptical of what you said, but that doesn't mean you don't have a lot of depth there and that there's a lot to examine. So I just, we were talking about kind of a variation of what you were saying just before we started the meeting this morning. I, I, I take these two sides that you're describing as being uh, not incommensurate, or at least they may be different, but they're different ways of looking at the same thing, or they're on a developmental, uh, historically on a developmental course. And I think, um, I mean, the person that comes to mind for me is Ernst Kassir, who wrote a lot about myth, mythic way of looking at the world, and has it, it became more rationalized and scientific, not to say that's always better, which is what people sometimes lament, but that it's, it's, it is a further development of mythic thinking. So. I think you're saying there are kind of two parts of the mind. One of them is more modern, and, it, and it's, it's, it can't exactly coexist simultaneously with the other part. Both, I think we have them both at the same time. Our problem today is our inability to see them both at the same time, to experience them both at the same time. Myth functions by gesture. It doesn't describe, it implies. It is a place from which you can experience both ways of experiencing the world, of seeing the world, and responding to it at the same time, and gives us a sense of wholeness. Myth becomes religion at a certain point. To me, myth plus politics equals religion. Well, I, I, I really had hoped, in fact, that's a very, we have to finish, and that's a, Interesting uh, end note because no, it really was my hope that that this would be this sort of two-sidedness to coding and to meaning connotation and denotation is something I was hoping we would be able to bring out here, and I think we did a really pretty good job. And I thank you all for your okay. for your contributions. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Can I make a little correction? Yes, please. <laughs> so I kept wondering whether we could have this conversation 2,000 years ago. And many of the things that we discussed here were discussed 2,000 years ago, yeah. exact same way. Yeah. And your answer about meat and so on was unanswered the same way. Symposium. They, so now, symposium. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you look at the grounding, that is, how you can make a, 
a, a uh, judgment whether there are two brains, as you said, emotional and cognitive brains, and this has been going on in humankind for a long time. Before DSM-5, DSM-4 actually had two axes, you know, and one set of psychiatrists dealt with the cognitive problems, the other comes with the, with the emotional problems. Now we know, now we know there is no part of the brain that would be dedicated to emotions. We know also there is no such a thing as fear center, because negative and positive in the Isula context, in the amygdala, wherever something bad is coded, next to it, adjacent to it, is the good. This is how the relationships are, are formed. And that is, just in short, there's no part in the brain that you can look at the MRI as it's like, we can distinguish and separate cognition from emotion. They evolve together. They are never separate. We, we have the beliefs that we can separate them, and those beliefs can persevere, and no amount of introspection can help. That's why I wrote back. But if you look into the brain, the debate will become simpler. But there are times where you have an emotion and you have no cognition until you actually. Absolutely. So how does that happen? Well, we could ever <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't. How do you do? You have a, a cognition without emotion. No. No. Okay. So can you have a well, reaction to something just through emotions? Yes, you can. So that I call adaptive behavior, and you can call it cognition. So if I avoid something because it's unpleasant, that's an adaptive behavior, and that's the definition of cognitive action also. To go? You say, <laughs> you say hotel, motel time? <laughs>